welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, new webinar of the Zeris Europe Live series. Uh, so my name is Esra Tat. I'm the Network and Development Coordinator and I'm uh, the chance to, um, to moderate this, um, this new webinar. So as I explained, uh, most of the time um, we, we, we collect ideas from, uh, from people who read our newsletter or follow the work of Zeris Europe. Um, and among the, the top five or seven topics uh, that were picked, reuse strategy at the city level was very, um, very high in the, in the list. Um, so today we'll be digging into this topic uh, with three, three speakers. Um, if you're interested in our contents, probably you also share this, this uh, understanding that our throwaway culture um, tends to show its limits and waste prevention, repair and reuse are the right answer. Um, in that sense, cities happen to be the perfect level uh, to promote reuse initiatives and gather citizens on around socially and environmentally um, sustainable projects. So the few questions that we'll try to answer today with our three speakers um, are actually, what can a municipality do um, to boost reuse? Uh, what is the job creation potential and economic savings of launching such initiatives, um, local reuse strategy? And actually, which are the best practices today in the reuse field? Um, so I invite you, you see we have a chat box and a Q&A box. Um, I invite you to, uh, to use the Q&A box to just introduce yourself, say who you are. Um, you will hear a lot from our speakers, but it's also great to know who, who you are and uh, where you come from. And my colleague Agnese will, uh, will moderate the, the, the chat. Um, we're here to discuss. We'll have 10 minute presentation from each of our speakers. Um, but please feel free to use the Q&A box um, to address your questions. We will have clarification questions after each presentation and a longer time for conversation at the end. So uh, without further delay, I'm just going to introduce briefly our three speakers. Um, so today we have the chance to have with us Antigone Dalamaga, who is the director at Ecorec and the reuse president and also board member of Zurich Europe. Um, Antigone's presentation will be followed up uh, with Matthew Hama, who is Policy Officer, um, Environmental Topics at Reuse. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to uh, the metropolitan area of Barcelona with Alejandro Pignol Montolio. Um, so how is going to work? Antigone will start now, uh, offering us a 10 minute presentation, um, digging on the topics of the local benefits of repair and reuse. Um, I invite you to, to listen very carefully everything single thing that Antigone will say because she has a massive experience on um, not only sustainable waste management, but also the real strategy at the uh, local level. Antigone has been involved in over 30 international projects on these topics. Um, and, uh, and she's also the president, as I said, of ECOREC, that is the um, a national NGO. I'm the director of Ecorec, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> director of Ecorec, exactly. Um, a national NGO in Greece that is promoting uh, prevention, reuse and, and recycling. So Antigone, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ezra. So just give me a second. So um, today I'm going to present uh, reuse. So it's R reuse, and it stands for Reuse and Recycling European Union Social Enterprises. It's a European network of mostly national and regional networks. So it's a network of networks uh, of social enterprises active in the field of reuse, repair, and recycling activities. Also, members that are uh, either individual social enterprises or, like in our case, individual. Uh, NGOs that promote prevention, uh, reuse, and recycling. So uh, this is a network, like I said, it has 28 national and regional members. These represent about 7,000 uh, reuse shops across Europe. And uh, together, members that reported at least uh, have uh, man managed in 2017 to divert over 1 million tons of uh, 
products and materials from landfill and incineration or uh, reuse, repair and recycling. As well, like I said, we're social enterprises. So uh, a big focus for us is also employing people. Uh, across the network, there are over 160,000 uh, employees, also uh, volunteers and trainees. So it's uh, many of our members are work integration social enterprises. So um, uh, they help uh, integrate people uh, back into the workforce. So you have trainees and volunteers and people that are just uh, distance from the work market trying to get back on, uh, on their feet. Um, as well, this represents uh, uh, an important economic activity. Our members uh, across, um, across the board had a turnover of over 1.4 billion euro in, uh, in Europe uh, last year. And uh, it also, it's a, all, all of these are community activities. So there are also uh, <clears throat> 40 million customers that went into their shops and had a chance to buy high quality goods um, at much lower prices. So it's mixing all the aspects, all the pillars of sustainable development, the social aspect, economic aspect, and the environmental aspect, and keeping it local. So do our members work in what, what was those 1 million tons? So um, mostly furniture, textiles, um, electrical and electronic goods, books, records, and uh, brat, so other household goods. And um, on the top, you can see the, the amounts that were collected. And at the, at the bottom, the amounts that were uh, reused. The rest um, went for recycling. Um, other streams that we also work in are bicycles, construction and demolition waste, bio waste, and uh, glass, paper, plastic, and wood. So like I said, uh, there are both environmental and social benefits for, uh, for reuse. Um, uh, studies show that uh, one th if one third of goods collected at waste recycling centers that are still reusable, and could be sold secondhand um, instead of being recycled or landfilled. And if only 1% of municipal waste in Europe was prepared for reuse, uh, there's a potential there of creating 200,000 uh, local jobs. Um, as well, uh, because uh, if you're looking at the uh, work integration aspect, um, uh, some governments, uh, whether they're local, national, regional, invest in uh, employing, uh, reintegrating people into uh, uh, through these work uh, placement programs. And uh, a study uh, by the ministry, um, the social ministry in Belgium, has shown that there's a net uh, return gain to the government. So after they've invested all this money, they get the money they've invested, and then back to society, there's an extra 12,000 uh, return on this investment for uh, work integration. Um, as well, uh, there's a great, but reuse creates a lot more uh, local jobs than any other type of uh, of uh, waste management, whether it's recycling, whether it's landfilling, whether it's uh, incineration. You see some of the numbers um, here. I would like to go now to um, uh, across Europe and see some of our uh, some of our members or members members and see how they uh, how they work with their local cities um, and what they contribute to their, their local cities. So my first example is the Rediscovery Center in, uh, in Dublin. Um, uh, they're a member of our Irish network, which is uh, Community Reuse Network Ireland. And uh, what they did with the help of, um, of Dublin City Council is they took over an old uh, boiler house that was abandoned and they converted it into uh, a sustainable community building where uh, members of the community can come and visit and, uh, and uh, take lessons. There re there's a reuse shop there. You can take courses on... Uh, upcycling, on refurbishing, and, and uh, so forth. In 2017, there were between 8,000 and 9,000 people that visited the Rediscovery Center, um, uh, as well as uh, about 6,000 students uh, that were uh, that Rediscovery Center went to visit in their schools and, and showed them uh, their activities. 
So it's composed of uh, four main uh, branches. You have the Rediscovery Fashion, which works on uh, on textiles and redesigning uh, uh, textiles and clothing. Uh, and it teaches people how to repair, reuse, and uh, take courses in uh, in basically uh, fixing clothes and uh, designing new clothes and so forth. There's um, Rediscovery uh, Rediscover Furniture, which aims uh, to bring new life to old furniture. So there you can go and learn how to restore uh, uh, furniture. You can uh, take furniture uh, courses. Uh, they also have a lot of reuse uh, activities and sales in their in the eco shop hosted in the uh, Rediscovery Center. Uh, something very interesting here. They also collect uh, paints from uh, recycling centers and uh, they sell them. They sell the recycled paint in their eco store for one, uh, one euro per liter. And the aim here is to divert paint from uh, disposal incineration and provide a affordable paint to, to the public and community organizations. They also have uh, the Rediscover Cycling, which collects bikes from the recycling centers, revamps them, uh, but it also provides on-site clinics um, uh, to pro promote local sustainable transport. They diverted over 12,000 kilos of waste in 2017. They employ 74 people, 36% of which are from uh, disadvantaged groups. They're primarily long-term unemployed or, uh, and on uh, progression training placements. And this is uh, funded by the Dublin City Council and the EPA, the Irish EPA. Moving on. Uh, we'll move to uh, the Helsinki uh, Metropolitan Area Reuse Centre, which uh, is called, and I hope I get this right, Keratiskeskus. Uh, uh, I apologize to any Finnish uh, <laughs> listener out there if I've uh, destroyed the word. Um, I'm told it means the reuse centre, so... Yeah, this is a co-owned by the Helsinki Metropolitan Area. It's a non-profit and uh, its aim is to provide alternatives to single-use culture. It collects and receives uh, fit for reuse donations. It has three shops and uh, from what it receives, it has 56% uh, is reused and 32% is recycled. It has a uh, line of upcycled products, which you see some uh, in the picture here. So uh, it's called Plan B. And uh, so it's people using their imagination to uh, transform materials that have, uh, and goods that have been discarded and recreating them into, uh, into something new. Um, so uh, plan B is for what uh, can't be reused uh, as is and needs to be uh, upcycled basically. We also have an environmental education program, which 60,000 people um, were visited uh, last year. So it's from children to businesses to educators and so forth and uh, and providing information on how you can uh, prevent reuse and recycle. They employ 480 people, 310 are permanent employees, 170 um, are have some other type of work, uh, uh, are in some type of other work program. Um, so about the customers, because like I said earlier, this is about also promoting things to be done locally at the community uh, level. Um, they had uh, transactions, 700,000 people uh, uh, had that purchased items in the, in the shop. Also, because their policy is to maximize reuse and uh, reuse, they also, anything that they feel can be reused, they also, uh, if you don't, there are some things that if you don't want to buy, Customers can take for free. So uh, they had 120,000 customers that took things um, for free. In total, the numbers, the items that were reused were uh, 4.3 million items, 2.9 were sold, and 1.4 were given away. And uh, the way they cooperate with um, uh, with Helsinki Metropolitan Area, like I said, uh, they're, they, the city is uh, the metropolitan area is. Uh, uh, has a small is a small uh, shareholder owner. Um, they work with them 
and their social services in the integration of, uh, of uh, local people. Um, Plan B also has um, agreements with the cities to refurbish old schools. And um, also Helsinki sometimes offers bank guarantees uh, when, there's a, when there's a need to, uh, to support the activity and so forth, which uh, they then themselves uh, pay back. Um, a little of the uh, footprint here and what natural resources um, were measured in savings. So 46.5 million kilos of uh, sol solid national uh, natural resources. In water, 3.1 million cubic uh, meter, uh, cubics, uh, cubic meters of water. And um, 12, over 12,500 12 tons of uh, CO2 um, um, Equivalents were uh, were 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 saved from the activities um, in 2017. And finally, um, my last example will be uh, uh, my before last example, if I have the time, Ezra. Um, the yes. uh, is uh, Avi in France. Thank you. Um, so Avi is a uh, social enterprise that mainly uh, has traditionally worked in WE. It's uh, 50 social enterprises uh, in cities across France. Um, they work in preparation for reuse of electrical and electronic equipment. Um, uh, they collect uh, about one-fourth of the WE generated in France. Uh, in 2016, they refurbished over 102,000 appliances. and They uh, employ about 2,500 people that were distance uh, 80 of which 80 percent of which were distanced from the from the labor market um, they've also expanded into other areas uh, office furniture but also I think uh, the most interesting um, is uh, a new project they launched this year called Envie Autonomy um, which works uh, the they thought well there's a need of People that have mobility issues and there's a whole bunch of uh, wheelchairs, hospital beds um, uh, and anything related to those types of needs that are discarded annually so they chose to um, start collecting them and start uh, developing an activity, local activity where they can um, distribute this across uh, the board so they repair them uh, and refurbish them. They uh, sell them at lower costs so that it's accessible to people that may not be able to afford it under regular circumstances. They provide uh, service, maintenance and repair, also spare parts. Um, and they also deliver because obviously it's very difficult for these people to uh, go get up and uh, get home. Um, and finally, uh, an example uh, in Greece, a project we're working on. This is on uh, the development of um, uh, pre uh, prevention and uh, reuse in, uh, in Greece in the area of WE. And uh, so in Greece, we were quite behind in um, developing preparation for reuse activities. We didn't uh, compare to other European uh, um, countries. So, um, a, uh, within the context of a life uh, project, we uh, we work with different partners, ranging from the um, a university, the PR system, and government bodies, uh, which allowed us to set up uh, prerequisites and standards, procedures, and and so forth to set up two um, we uh, preparation for reuse centers. The first one uh, was set up in Attica, and it collects uh, 1,000 uh, tons uh, per year, and 200 tons uh, must be uh, prepared for reuse. Um, 20 employees are, are going to be working in, in the preparation for reuse activity. The second one that's about to be launched is in the north of Greece, outside of the Saloniki, the municipality of Oreo Castro, and that will have uh, 500 um, year uh, capacity uh, and will um, and will uh, prepare for reuse a hundred at least a hundred tons um, of we as well the other part is working locally with a lot of um, uh, local actors to do 
prevention. So we've set up um, a prevention um, platform, prevention platform uh, so that people across Greece can uh, sign up and say what we they have to give and they can meet up with people in their local um, communities and uh, exchange them. And the other one is the promotion of repair cafes across Greece. So it's teaching people how to prevent, how to uh, learn what maybe they've, uh, they've forgotten and, um, and uh, see that something that may be just a little bit broken can be fixed and uh, ex their lifestyle, their lifespan ex extended. So I'm gonna wrap up uh, by saying uh, that we should put second hand first, if you put second hand first, um, I dare say it's also putting local communities first, putting uh, the environment first and uh, creating local jobs first. That's it from me and uh, I put back to you, uh, Ezra. Thank you very much, Antigone. Um, I think you can stop sharing your screens that we, we see yeah. you. Um, for the reminder. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for, for sharing this uh, very, um, uh, the, the numbers that you shared from the beginning are, are very promising, um, especially the one when you mentioned that one person of uh, preparation for reuse has a potential of job creation of um, 200,000 uh, yeah, uh, jobs. Um, I had the, maybe one, one question. You, you gave a few examples um, of, um, of Dublin, um, etc. How can we uh, attract uh, investors or, 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 or people who can invest in a way in this type of, um, of places? Because from the understanding we have now is that these are the type of project that needs to happen. And I believe it's also part to, partly to the work of the reuse network, uh, the 28 uh, national and regional networks. But uh, how do we make these things happen? What are usually the type of partnership that make these places exist? Yeah, I'm starting it, okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, I don't think it's a one size fits all um, solution, huh? because uh, uh, every community is different, but every country is very different in, in, in uh, what is supported. And you have uh, some countries that really support, whether it's uh, work integration, whether it's uh, reuse aspects, whether it's uh, uh, prevention and so forth. So you have different examples across um, across the field you have uh, I don't know if uh, Mathieu is going to uh, go into um, examples like the uh, uh, like Belgium and uh, and stuff like that yes Mathieu. I will <laughs> okay so <laughs> so I'll stick to uh, a broader uh, scope of uh, of a response and Mathieu can go into the details and then we can go back and cover whatever we've left um, We've, we've left out. I think, first of all, when you're looking, uh, if you're looking specifically at, uh, at reuse shops, you need to make sure that uh, you develop a culture of, of reuse. So it's, it's like selling any, any other product. Huh? You have to make it, you have to provide uh, a high quality product, a product that's attractive to people who want to, want to buy. Uh, so uh, a lot of our members, and if you go in into the shops and and whatever they work um, a lot over the years into professionalizing this the sector, making it competitive with uh, a regular shop, huh? Because you have to walk in, you have to make things attractive, or else people aren't going to um, uh, to buy them. So it's not only making the price attractive, it's also, or wanting to support a local group, it's also making uh, your product and, and the space you sell it in attractive as well. Huh? Um, it's building trust in the community. It's uh, making sure you have access to the waste stream or to high quality uh, donations. So it's making sure as well that people will give you their stuff. Because if you're not getting the stuff, then you're not going to get a good, uh, a good product. It's working with your city. 
and trying to develop uh, synergies with your city. In some cases, uh, they're very close and the city wants to uh, develop this as well because they see it as a win-win uh, situation. In, uh, in other cases where uh, Matthew is going to go more into detail, um, there are in specific measures that are, that are taken into place. I think it's best that um, Mathieu go through, well, after Mathieu has finished or at the end, we can, we can cover what uh, hasn't been covered. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's you already gave some uh, some indicators from the need of not only the collection part that I think Matthew is going to cover now, but also the different policies that need to be implemented. But you also mentioned this key thing about developing a, a culture um, of, of, of reuse. And, uh, and I keep in mind this figure that you gave one third of the good collected today um, at recycling centers are actually still reusable. So I think we there's the, the potential is also massive when it comes to um, community impact but also resource preservation. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm moving to our second speaker, Mathieu. We mentioned your name a few times already. <laughs> so Mathieu Rama is a policy officer, um, um, environmental issues at Reuse. Um, so Antigone presented Reuse uh, briefly, but Mathieu, you're going to help us understand a bit more the policies that can be implemented at the local level to really boost this, um, these reuse strategies. Um, also improving the recycling rates um, and etc. So Exactly. Thank, thank you, you very much, Ezra, yeah, for thank the you. and uh, thank you, Antigone, for uh, having uh, introduced uh, reuse, um, for which I work as a policy officer. Uh, so we'll focus more on the uh, policy aspect. So what in uh, the legislation that, uh, we, that uh, municipality wants to implement or which uh, they have to implement uh, thanks to their uh, responsibility in managing waste, uh, what they can do to encourage reuse. So um, in four points, uh, firstly, the, through the use of green and social public procurement, uh, especially for contracts related to waste management, obviously. Um, then uh, you can also use uh, targets for uh, preparing for reuse and prevention, uh, which can be more relevant at the regional or national level, but which can could still be applied at the city level. Uh, then you have strategies to encourage citizens to reuse uh, and repair their products. Uh, I will um, focus on uh, good practice from Graz uh, concerning that, but also mention a few things about Barcelona, but without mentioning too much because apparently Alejandro, Alejandro will also talk about Barcelona in the next presentation. And uh, then uh, how important is this to uh, make investments in uh, quality collection points in order to improve uh, the logistic and maximize uh, reuse. Um, so first of all, I wanted to remind you about the public procurement directive, um, which is uh, thanks to two articles, making sure that municipalities uh, can go beyond uh, the, um, the rule of the cheapest offer uh, when uh, contracting uh, with companies uh, by using what is called the most economically advantageous tender, uh, which allows municipalities to integrate factors such as uh, quality and sustainability uh, and to not uh, only go for the cheapest uh, offer. Uh, and you can also, as a municipality, uh, use a reserve contract uh, and then give a competitive advantage to social enterprises, uh, which uh, tend to favor reuse, as um, Antigone explained uh, earlier. Uh, there's also a great improvement in the recently updated Waste from Act Directive. And so it has been updated last year, and it's still under transposition phase until uh, July 2020. Uh, and it says that member states uh, have to give access to waste collection points um, for uh, waste for uh, preparing for reuse and uh, repair networks. Um, it means that when uh, some when a facility which was not uh, necessarily uh, focused on uh, reuse, uh, they still have to make sure that uh, an access is facilitated for these networks. And uh, so. With a transposition, hopefully member states uh, will uh, promote preparing for use activities, notably by using a procurement criteria. So this article is also mentioning that procurement criteria can be used to, uh, facilitate, uh, to facilitate the access to waste collection points 
for uh, preparing for reuse and repair networks. Um, so uh, to give you ideas about how that can be made um, through uh, social uh, public procurement, uh, here is an example um, in uh, Vicenza in Italy, uh, where they made sure that uh, every company contracting uh, with the city has at least 30% of its workers um, who were disadvantaged uh, before taking uh, the job. Uh, so it's a part of an effort from the city to reintegrate people on the job market. Um, so our member in CME benefited from uh, this public procurement policy because they uh, respect uh, this criteria. Uh, in CME was created in 1979 and they uh, provide professional training to uh, more than 30 trainees and uh, professional integration for around 20 people. So uh, thanks to this uh, public procurement uh, policy, uh, they, uh, they run 10 uh, waste collection centers uh, in Vicenza and they deal with, they also deal with the collection of uh, bulky uh, urban solid waste, so uh, furniture or uh, large household appliances, um, thanks to a uh, door-to-door -door collection system, so to facilitate uh, the collection, to, for the discarder to be, uh, for, for it to be more easier for, uh, for the discarder, uh, they set up a door-to-door -door collection system and uh, through these two sources of collection, um, they are able to extract and prepare for reuse uh, what is reusable. Um, as Antigone mentioned earlier, the reason why it's interesting to use social uh, clauses uh, when uh, procuring um, for um, waste management uh, activities, it's uh, because contracting with social economy enterprises encourages reuse because um, their objective is to create more jobs, as much jobs as possible. And since uh, prevention and uh, reuse are uh, the waste management activities which uh, create the more jobs, uh, they tend to prioritize a reuse uh, as much as possible instead of uh, incineration or uh, early recycling. Um, there is also uh, Pamplona in Spain, which uh, recently, uh, in two, 2017, uh, published a tender for the collection, transportation, valorization of waste, such as uh, wheat, textile, and glass. Um, they uh, included environmental and social criteria in the tender for, um, for that. Uh, so it allowed our member to Aperos de Maus de Navarra to get uh, the tender. Um, so this is another example which is quite similar to the one which I just mentioned uh, in Vicenza, but we have a lot of different good examples. Uh, I have a link towards um, a document which lists all of them so you will be able to find more information and to have a comprehensive list of all the municipalities uh, which use the public, uh, uh, like a green public procurement, or social public procurement to encourage reuse uh, with more details and uh, data. So now um, a few words about um, targets, uh, which tend to be more applied at uh, regional or national level, but which, which could be implemented at uh, the level of city. It's just that we don't have an example uh, so far, but uh, that might be uh, implementable. Uh, so to give you inspiration, there is, for example, the Wallonian government decree, which uh, requires 2% of uh, waste electric and electronic equipment to be prepared for reuse uh, from January 2020. Uh, 2020 sorry. And uh, Flanders, which has also set a reuse target of 7 kilo reuse material per capita to be achieved by 2022. Um, so you have the Wallonian target, which is more related to waste management and uh, the other one in Flanders, which is more about uh, waste prevention and uh, reuse. So it's mainly due to the fact that the policies in terms of what is waste and what is non-waste can be different uh, in, to take that into account, but uh, it's not necessarily um, <laughs> the point of today. Um, so we, we encourage cities to uh, also set reuse targets. Uh, since uh, member states uh, seem to be still quite reluctant to do so, you only have uh, in Spain, um, in uh, Belgium, um, that um, these targets are implemented. 
uh, and you could use a public procurement criteria by saying, for example, that uh, contractors for uh, waste management facilities uh, could um, ha would have to reach a given preparing for use target uh, to be a successful contractor. Uh, this could be a way to um, to make sure that uh, that reuse is encouraged. Uh, and also, uh, uh, going back to the last point, the, the point of having targets um, at uh, at any level, at national, regional, or uh, city level, is really to encourage the cooperation between uh, all the stakeholders. So the reuse uh, operators, the municipality, but also when they exist, um, the uh, like. For example, retailers, uh, they, or, they often have for electronics um, more uh, generally, they have to collect uh, waste and uh, having targets is a way to ensure that they will give access to that portion to, uh, of, to reuse operators. So this is why we really insist uh, at reuse on um, having uh, reuse targets. Uh, then there are ways also that we identified, for example, in Graz, uh, in Austria to encourage your citizens to uh, reuse and repair because it's not only about collection and the uh, waste management systems, it's also making sure that citizens um, want to uh, repair the stuff or to uh, buy second hand. So here is an example uh, in Graz, uh, which uh, um, they um, launched in 2017 a system to give citizens uh, the opportunity to be uh, reimbursed um for up to 50 percent of repair costs amounting to a maximum of 100 euro per year uh, so for the first year you had 160 households which uh, used uh, this uh, system uh, 90 plus 90 of uh, these demands were during the first two months so it was highly anticipated people really wanted this system to be uh, put in place um, especially because repairing became um, more and more expensive uh, because products are less and less repairable, uh, more complicated to repair. So it makes sense to help the consumer to uh, to take uh, the good decision. Um, and um, also, Grass uh, allowed the non-commercial non-commercial repair initiatives such as the repair cafes to have uh, like to be funded uh, for of for up to 1,200 euro per year. Um, I, uh, there is also an, another example, I don't know if Alejandro will talk about it um, for Barcelona, but there, I had the possibility to visit uh, Meilleur Que Nous uh, in Barcelona, which um, I was quite impressed about because, so but basically Barcelona, they uh, set up um, kind of municipal uh, repair cafe. Uh, where people can, uh, is Alejandro, are you going to talk about it or, uh, okay, so Alejandro will talk about it, so I, I won't, uh, <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so then I will conclude with uh, what needs to be done in terms of uh, investments in quality collection points, um, which is extremely important if you want to improve the uh, reuse, uh, reuse rate of uh, waste which is collected. Um, you, so you need to make sure that reusable products uh, are collected um, as early as possible in the waste collection process and uh, separately from recyclables. Um, you need to make sure that reusable products are stored in a way which uh, protects them from, uh, from uh, the rain so that they are weatherproof covered and that they are manipulated uh, properly uh, to safeguard their reusability. And you also need to make sure that depending on um, the type of city in which uh, you are operating, um, you make it as convenient as possible for the discarder to access the collection points. So let's say if you are in a highly dense, uh, like a highly populated area, so a very dense area, you need to have like several small collection points uh, for um, for small items uh, coupled with a door-to-door -door collection for bulky waste items. Um, you need to make sure that the transportation uh, when door-to-door -door collection is made is in, done in a way which safeguards we use. Um, but if you are in a more um, rural area, it makes sense to, uh, 
to gather uh, different, like to have, um, to share the cost of reuse between different municipalities in, term, in order to rationalize the collection. Um, so, uh, talking again about the quality, we had a campaign uh, with ECOS, uh, which uh, is uh, our partner in making uh, standards um, more uh, uh, environmentally friendly, like they, they are the organization representing the civil society in the standardization process. And uh, we made a campaign uh, in the framework of uh, the uh, discussions around uh, the um, we preparing for these standards. Uh, so this is uh, on the left what uh, shouldn't happen and on the right what should happen. So you need to uh, properly uh, protect the products uh, when uh, you collect them in order to um, create reuse. Um, and I will conclude uh, with uh, mentioning a project uh, in which uh, reuse is involved. Um, so it's called Surface, it's an interreg project, so funded uh, by the European Commission and uh, which um, aims at uh, improving environmental management and quality of life in uh, urban areas through promoting reuse. So uh, the project identifies and establishes uh, reuse-oriented services in uh, the pilot regions and uh, connect the cities uh, in these regions with uh, smart reuse parks uh, that will be integrated then into local waste prevention and management uh, strategies. So uh, there are pilot activities which are implemented and uh, carried out in uh, Austria, Italy, Germany, Poland and Hungary, uh, which will be then, um, after a feasibility study, uh, replicated in Slovenia, Croatia and Czech Republic. Uh, so the partners of this project include uh, ourselves, uh, we use uh, our Italian member uh, in CMA, which I talked about a bit earlier, and um, waste management agencies, uh, regions and uh, research institutes. So you can contact my colleague, uh, my colleague uh, Jana for more information about that. Thank you. Thank and you, also you have some yes. documentation at the end of the presentation, which will be circulated where you can find uh, even more uh, good practices. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, thank you for the, the, the policy um, um, overview. I, so in our webinars, I invite you to stop sharing your screen as well so that we can mm -hmm. so, yeah. see. Yeah. Um, so we, we start having a few questions. I, I really invite uh, everyone to, to, to drop your questions. And it's quite interesting because in the series of webinars we had, uh, whenever we, we, we climb up in the Zeres hierarchy, moving from collection to prevention, um, we also feel that most of the people struggle to really know how to implement it. So thanks already to both of you for the, for the insights. Um, so, Mathieu, most of the people who attend our webinars, or just to give you an idea, uh, part of them are campaigners, uh, part of, uh, of them are from municipalities, and we have also some individual uh, activists um, and a few waste consultants. W would you say today that the, the European legislation is ambitious enough when it comes to reuse? You mentioned that you'd like to have targets. Just, just to give an understanding of the current framework because you you gave some precise policies but mm -hmm. overall where are we with the ambitious fra the policy framework well the thing is that uh, with uh, the recent update of the waste format directive uh, we managed to have a, a lot of positive things um, in particular the fact uh, like the article 11.8 that i described earlier is showing that now uh, there is um we need an interest from uh, the EU institutions to promote reuse by giving access to waste collection points. Uh, there, are, there is also wording in the Waste from Act Directive about uh, eco-design, uh, about encouraging the setting up of uh, reuse uh, networks uh, by encouraging them uh, with uh, fiscal measures uh, in uh, producer responsibility um, systems or with uh, the uh, Extended producer responsibility schemes, uh, reuse will have to be encouraged. Uh, but still, what we miss uh, for now is a stronger wording because uh, in the Waste Format Directive, in general, reuse is encouraged, uh, has to be promoted by member states. What we lack of is uh, something as strong as the recycling targets, 
which uh, we still do not have. Uh, for now, it's uh, combined preparing for reuse and recycling targets, which means that the member states can definitely reach uh, this target without uh, doing any reuse, um, which is uh, what we advocated for and uh, which we didn't manage to get, apart from the fact that now member states uh, will have to report separately on uh, reuse and on preparing for reuse. Uh, so uh, taking into account if it comes from waste or non-waste. And um, hopefully uh, the Commission will manage through this obligation to report separately on reuse and preparing for reuse, enough data to then propose a target uh, which uh, will have to be considered by uh, 2025. Thank you very much. So um, in, in your, your final slide, you were giving some uh, uh, links to, to, to examples um, that are best practices. Um, thank you very much. I think in the last part of our conversation, we'll go back to these examples um, because some of them might go beyond the current uh, legislation mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would be interesting to know a bit how they work. Um, we're collecting all the questions and, and actually keeping them for, for the last part of the conversation. There was just one clarification for you, Mathieu. You, you mentioned the uh, uh, surface project in Poland and one yeah. of the questions was, which city is it? Um, let me check. It's in. Uh, uh, so sorry for how I pronounce it. Uh, I will. I will uh, copy paste it in the. In the chat box. <laughs> okay. I, I will be afraid I won't be able to pronounce it properly. So Kurasko Pomorski region in Poland. Okay, great. There, there are a few questions that relate to uh, the cultural part of um, of this, but let, let's skip them for um, for yeah. after. Um, thank you very much, Mathieu. Um, so I'm moving now to our uh, third uh, speaker, to Alejandro Pinel uh, Montolio, who is uh, from the um, the area, me the metropolitan area of Barcelona. Yeah. Um, so Alejandro, you are the waste prevention and recycling points technician, um, and you're going to um, to take us or to explain us actually one of the project uh, a program called Better Than You. Um, and explaining how you, you coordinate precisely this collection and treatment from uh, 70 recycling um, points. No, ju just the Better Than New project. Okay. Not that's, the second part. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so I invite you to share your screen and, uh, and, yeah, and do the 10 minute presentation. And thanks for all the people who start asking questions. Can you hear me? Ready? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, as, as I said, I'm Alex Pignol from the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona. Uh, just a quick view uh, for what, what is Metropolitan Area. It's uh, Metropolitan Area, it's a public administration that includes Barcelona. It's here, the big one, and the 35 municipalities around. And in these six, 600 uh, square meters, we feed the um, half of the population of Catalonia. Okay, solid waste to, the, to us and we take care of them. Uh, we treat, take care. Uh, last year, last year we managed, uh, as you can see, one and a half million tons, and it represents 1.26 kilos per inhabitant per day. It's growing a little bit again after the crisis. I think it's everywhere the same. And to manage, to manage this, we have the composting plants, packaging selection, and uh, incinerator too, and biomechanic treatment. We produce such amount of waste because you, you know all the, all the problems, uh, all the people here, I'm sure that maybe can list more than these five. So as, a, as the waste preven prevention section, uh, we have been working promoting the reuse of things that can last longer. Uh, our proposals are the promotion of repairing and the secondhand market and how we do it. Firstly, just making a, compilation of the repair and second-hand professional shops of the, all the 36 municipalities. 
we have recorded around 2,500 uh, 2, uh, workshops. We have them in paper and also in this website where you can choose uh, between repair, buy, sell, and then uh, what object do you want in, what, uh, in, in, the, in the area near you. And the, the website gives you uh, several options. Options like, like this. This, this. this is the kind of workshop I mean, or secondhand store. Okay. Also, uh, we have a, a newsletter to report all the flea markets of our area and all Catalonia too. You can subscribe in that link. Uh, that's the kind of flea market I'm, I'm telling. And the, the, big, the big project is this, uh, this, this second line. Uh, to teach how to repair. Uh, we have a workshop in the city center of Barcelona, almost Mathieu spoiled it before. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, we, we give the, a bench, the tools and technical advice to the citizens, to people to, uh, who come with their, their objects. Also, uh, we give some classes in several topics and if people can, cannot come, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel too. So first of all, we need a, a, a great team of people because uh, dealing every day with people, it's, uh, not, it's not an easy job. Uh, we are a public administration, uh, we are for free, so it's not, they have to be prepared for that. And that's an example of uh, what people can do there. Uh, we help people, uh, fixing the electronics like, like this, print, the printer, the classic computers. Also, it's a topic to, I don't know if you can see, most of the times to repair it, more, uh, more than repair it, to clean the, the display. Also, we, we teach people how to, how to fix the, their clothes. We have several machines and also we have uh, uh, classes for to, to teach how to upcycle. Here's an example from a shirt you have a pillow. The other topic is the, the bicycles. It's growing the, the use in Barcelona lately. So we have a lot of people coming here to fix their, them. And the, the biggest uh, workshop, because it has several rooms, is the carpentry. We have one to, to send. Because it makes a lot of dust, so it's closed, and you can see all the the, the vacuum up, up there. Another to paint and varnish, and a big one to for the cleaner jobs. Okay. As I told you, we have uh, classes, and we show uh, we have classes and to teach in case the. Uh, they need it in, in another time. You, you, don't, you don't bring the object, but, but you, you have it at, at home. This kind of uh, things too, with rubber. And these classes, they need to, to and they need a registration. Uh, this is the formal line that you can do it uh, in person at the, at the workshop. We have these classes in this uh, big, uh, place in Barcelona, but also we can bring it uh, all around the 36 municipalities. This is an example in Villa de Cans in the recyc recycling point. This is in a civic center in San Cugat, furniture in San Just, or bikes in Tiana. And uh, the, an, an example of the YouTube channel. You have the, the link here if you want to take a look. And the third line we are working is the an exchange an exchange uh, shop. Uh, we have 500 uh, square meters. I show you this. Uh, so we let the people uh, li uh, leave uh, their stuff. We, we give them some points, and with these points they can give other stuff. They can get other stuff. Okay. There is no money there. Example. These are the the latest photos we have. And to be in contact with people, we have to be online. So we have a blog, Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram. And even though uh, you, some neighbors of the, the workshop don't know we are there. So it's, it's difficult to achieve everybody. 
some data for the people who like some data. We give uh, 2,000 services per month at the, at the shop in the city center. It represents one and a half tons of waste prevention. In the repairing advising, uh, uh, we have a, it's a medium, it's a 85% of rate. Uh, it's, you, you can fix almost in textile furniture, but it, it's less uh, with electronics. We have attended uh, more than uh, 30,000 people since we started in 2006, and we have several followers on Facebook and a lot of plays on YouTube. This is uh, a pilot still. Uh, it's an example of two libraries, just few tools for the for some users in the in the in our carpentry workshop. It's just for for our users uh, at the moment. It, it, it depends how people behave. If we have success, we are going to, to increase. And just the last, it's not about repair, it's about uh, reuse and avoiding uh, waste. We have a, a kitchen when, where we teach people to, to cook with left, leftovers. I have to say that they have a lot of success because if you ha uh, give food, people come for sure. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for this quick overview of, of the, the case. Um, I actually had a few questions for you because, so you mentioned um, that six two thousand and uh, that that's the, the project that the program started in 2006 um, and you already uh, served like uh, over 30,000 people. Um, it also links to some of the direct questions that I'm receiving. Um, can you explain according to you what were the the, the success, the, the success uh, factors of, uh, of, of the program and probably in parallel, uh, why you think today that it, it does not develop even more? So probably what made it successful and what could make it even more successful? Uh, I, I think we had, uh, if we succeed is because it was a, a very in, innovative project also, but because we were on media, we were on the national TV in Catalonia. It brings us a lot of, of people. We're in the city center in an area where with a lot of tradition about repairing, about secondhand market. So the, the neighborhood it's, uh, has this culture. And uh, why we, we don't have more, more people, you, you said. That's what you said. Yeah, what, what could make it even more successful? What can, be more, what can what, we do? What could make it even more successful? I would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe if I, if I could, if you have some ideas, but also if you also saw it, um, an evolution since 2006, maybe both, both questions. Uh, we have seen that the, this culture has been growing uh, at the beginning. Uh, flea market, uh, there were just few uh, a month or a year. Now uh, in Barcelona almost all, all the time, uh, every week you have a flea market, one or two or three. Uh, we we can, cannot control that, but there is a, an application called Wallapop, at least in Spain. It, it, it has advertisement on TV every time. So the second, second hand market is growing. Uh, about repair, I think it's, uh, it depends on the item. Uh, we could see that the, a lot of shops closing, but another opening, uh, usually now for the mobiles and, and bikes and clothes has been opening again. Yeah. So thank you very much. And, and I think um, we probably will hear a bit more about um, this, this example. Um, uh, just maybe a question. When the program was started um, 10 years ago, what was the the ambition or the, the intention? Did you set up uh, at that time some, uh, some targets? Yeah, we, we have uh, in uh, the Metropolitan Plan about the waste uh, management and prevention, we had a target of uh, reduce, I think it was uh, in Europe the same, 10% uh, from the, the waste from 2010. But, but, but we got it because of the crisis, not because of the project for sure, as you say. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned something about the change of the culture and uh, we have three or four very, I would say, meaty questions uh, uh, that really relates to things that the three of you mentioned. So um, I'm taking, so there are some direct questions to me. There are some other questions asked to the panelists. So feel free to still ask them. Um, there's one key question and I will invite you three to, uh, to unmute yourself um, and to, to start answering um, any of the, the questions. But there's one key question that comes over and over again on the culture change. Um, so uh, there's one question about the fact that uh, reuse centers are often social places where people can meet. Um, the person gives the example of the recyclerie in France uh, or during repair cafes or in a cool bar made with reuse items. Um, so the, how can we actually make uh, it's not only about reusing or creating job, but also a new narrative about community aspect of reuse. Um, and the person asked, could you maybe elaborate on this or tell us how you see it? So how we can make this uh, uh, offer more attractive and maybe the community dimension, how central is it? Um, I think Antigone, you mentioned from the beginning that developing the quality of the product as, was as important as building the community, but going back to how do we build this culture or yeah, how can we make this more mainstream? Do we have any examples uh, or ideas? Well, what I can say is uh, a lot of our, of the reuse members are combining uh, shops with cafes, not, not only repair cafes, but actual uh, cafes where people can sit down, have a drink, uh, chat and they're making it in uh, a community experience uh, other other examples is is you know it's it, it's changing a mind frame also uh, a lot of people have uh, you know grown up thinking you know new the shinier the newer the better it'll, better it'll last longer and whatever and that's not only that's not only the case, but it, it's also a question of um, of it's a challenge to I guess the reuse shops or the reuse centers themselves. Now they need to brand themselves as something that's uh, trendy as well. Huh? they can't work outside the, the the community and they can't work outside the the market if you want to use uh, that word uh, and so forth but give a very simple uh, example you know if you have a an old you know a dress that's uh, 10 years old you know you can just hang it somewhere and say okay this is this is an old dress or you can say oh look at this is such a retro or vintage dress or whatever and it's about uh you know really finding ways to to get across to your community in uh, in november i was uh in uh, in siam in Vicenza and they had a fashion show with uh you know with a whole bunch of people from the from the community they had maybe i don't know 60 70 models and everybody came along to cheer them and whatever and it was it was an event it was a local event it was everybody had to go and and uh you know, loved it. You have competitions. You have different ways of involving uh, everyone and making it uh, mainstream. It's also about combating uh, mindsets um, and things like that. And it's a it's an ongoing um, project, uh, process. Many of our members have also uh, banded. You know, they were a uh, hundred different uh, so social enterprises you know maybe the same members of the same group but in some countries they said well you know what we have to maintain the same name have the same colors and have the same brand so we become uh, uh, it's recognizable that we stand for quality that we stand for professionalism that we stand for whatever series uh, they st and it was it was a process it wasn't something that you know you just change the sign and the name and um, and that was it it was it was a process Thank you. Um, Alejandro Mathieu, would you like to add anything? Yes, of course. Um, to complete what Santigone said, uh, yeah, um, yeah, our members are trying to make sure as much as possible that their products are attractive. Um, they, want, they, they try to make the 
second hand products look uh, as new as it is possible. Uh, for example, um, for electronics in particular, people really want to buy quality uh, and things that they, they think will last. So, for example, our member on the in France and uh, even in Belgium, um, uh, the, uh, the members of resources, they, are, they have to um, respect a label called uh, EcoRev, uh, which, um, which is both for quality and the social aspect of the product. Um, and uh, they also propose a guarantee, uh, so commercial guarantees for the products to assure uh, that the consumer will uh, live for, with uh, quality products. Um, then uh, I think that the mindset needs also to be changed uh, at a policy level. Like uh, Alejandro uh, said uh, before that uh, the, the action like Mayor Kenu is successful uh, in uh, Barcelona. Uh, and uh, one of the factors is because uh, people uh, heard about it. Like it was advertised on TV, if I remember well. Um, like people need to see, like if you want to mainstream reuse, you need to use the mainstreams which uh, are uh, influencing uh, the consumers. It's just that when you are on uh, the internet today, well, like the, the commercials on Facebook, like what you see on the TV, uh, it's to sell new products. And uh, at some point, you also need to have governments which uh, encourage the right advertisement of uh, buying second hand, of repairing your own products. And it's not there yet. And uh, this is what hopefully will be encouraged uh, thanks to the transposition of the waste format directive. At least it, it needs to be done. Like, like the tools to influence the consumer are there. It's just that the money is not uh, yet set on uh, what needs to be promoted. Thank you very much. Um, maybe to have an idea about who are the, the consumers of, of already this type of services. Alejandro, I don't know if you have any, any study because um, you have 13 years of, uh, of this Better Than You program and 30,000 people. Are you able to say more or less who are the people today who, who come like their profile more or less? Do you have any ideas? The profile in our center where, where we teach people how to repair, it's a woman between 40 and 60 years old and from the neighborhood, not too, too far away. That's the typical uh, user we have. Okay. And I don't know if from the reuse network, you already, you have some, some ideas or do you have a trend of who are the, the people who are mostly using this type of, uh, I would say, services in a very broad way? To be very complicated to answer, I think um, I don't have any data in mind. I know that it also depends on uh, the, uh, the type of products um, that we, we are talking about. Um, but uh, no, I can't really, I don't have any uh, data in mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the network yeah, is so one. broad. Uh, mm. yeah network is so broad Ezra that uh, it's it's very um, it's very difficult to uh, to pinpoint um, you have some cases where some of the reuse shops are um, you know focus on providing goods to people from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds but in most cases it's 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 a very wide spectrum from uh, uh, young people and students and, you know, moving into their first apartment or, uh, you know, people wanting to redecorate or, uh, you know, just everyday people, you know, I mean, uh, there's no real uh, specific, uh, it's too, the network is too broad to actually, you know, point it. Yeah. I was also asking the question to connect it with one of the, the questions we received about um, any, any program that could really uh, target young kids, uh, probably part of the creating a culture of, of reuse or, or mainstreaming it would also start today with, uh, with the younger generation. In your different experiences, do you have one or two examples of program targeting specifically younger um, people or even kids? Yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, many of our members do. I, uh, I think both the Rediscovery Center and um, 
the Helsinki Reuse uh, Center, not to use, I don't have the word, <laughs> the Finnish word in front of me, the Finnish name. Um, they have uh, programs uh, aimed specifically for, for, for children, not only, and not exclusively uh, always, but um, both of them do. I think uh, it would be best to contact your, uh, your local uh, centers or national networks and they can tell you what's available in, in, in their language. I know um, in Greece we just uh, wrapped up a project uh, last month, a project called um, Prevention for Students at Home and at School. So it's what students uh, can do. Uh, so it's a presentation in school. We went to five cities, six now, um, uh, with a guide, uh, widely distributed. And uh, for those of you uh, interested as well, I, I've spoken to um, Matt from Zero Waste Europe, not met you from Reuse. And uh, there's also a cartoon that's, uh, um, I guess, a TV cartoon. Uh, minute video that's going to be uh, translated and uploaded as well so uh, uh, about uh, how children can prevent it throughout their, you know daily routines and things like that you know. uh, not in my section uh, directly but uh, in the metropolitan metropolitan area we have a, a service of uh, environmental education and the most important thing is to, to bring kids to the the treatment plans I show you, the, the composting, the selection packaging, that's the, 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 the best thing you can do, I think, to, to show the, the large amount of waste, the best campaign you can do for, for the kids. And in that sense, not only for kids. Uh, for everybody, for everybody, yeah. Yeah, probably most, most of the people do not know. And, and again, coming back to what uh, the number that uh, Antigone gave at the very beginning, one third of the goods today uh, are still actually reusable and they end up in recycling centers or even landfill or, or incinerated. Um, so it's, th there's a question that connects a bit um, the, the local and the national level. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read the question. The person says, I think one of the biggest challenges is the coordination between citizens, um, the local authorities and the enterprises to create this effective real strategy. Um, and the question is, how European and national policies could go further to reinforce a bit better this coordination. Um, I think Mathieu, you already gave some, some ideas of what could be from the policy framework, but coming precisely to this coordination between these three players, what, what is your vision? Uh, well, uh, as we, as I said, um, what we advocate for to make this cooperation happen is uh, through uh, reuse targets um, because then it encourages all the stakeholders on uh, on the chain to uh, talk um, but at the end of the day it's, it's quite simple the thing is that yeah municipalities need to look at the reuse operators uh, who are already existing on the territory try to uh, make sure that partner uh, to have partnerships with them to give them access to waste collection point but also to uh, to advertise um, because most of the time today in special cities you have uh, recycling systems like you have separate collection for recycling and in general you go on a website uh, dealt with by the city where it says where uh, like uh, like how it's uh, how separate collection is done uh, the type of product that you need to separate at home and then on this website, you need to have a uh, clear advertisement that uh, reuse operators are existing, how to reach them, how you can call them so they can collect your reusable stuff. Um, I mean, it needs to be made simple for the discarder. Um, it needs to be uh, encouraged. And then uh, when we talk about the enterprises, uh, which are uh, often involved, especially for electronics, uh, in uh, external produce responsibility schemes. Uh, it needs to be clear that um, they uh, have a responsibility to, uh, to pay for it, uh, but that the um, management uh, would be uh, better done maybe by some of the operators. Um, because what the, the fact that so people, where people buy electronics, it's also the place where they uh, can uh, bring back their uh, waste is a good uh, solution, but it needs to be highly uh, regulated because it 
it might happen sometimes that uh, retailers they don't really want to encourage reuse because for them it's competition obviously and uh, we had cases uh, when uh, retailers had um, had the, the obligation to collect uh, waste at uh, their place that they uh, break uh, the products that they uh, that they collect so it needs to be um, to be uh, the collection needs to be done by the operators who have the most uh, interest of uh, safeguarding the reusability uh, which I, I don't want to say that it's always the case but uh, it's uh, it's better if this collection is done by municipality with uh, reuse operators uh, there to uh, to distinguish what is reusable and what is recyclable um, and uh, yeah, to uh, encourage these partnerships uh, in this way. Thank you, Mathieu. There's, there was a question about the, it's more the, the national, very yeah, local legal framework, so I'm not sure able to reply, but um, one of the participants was asking, do we have also some insurance issues um, when it comes to, for example, the repair cafes? And uh, I don't know if Antigone, uh, you can reply or, yeah, Mathieu, yeah, please. Okay, well, I think uh, I, my guess would be that the person asking is most likely from uh, UK or Ireland. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, for repair cafes, there is an issue um, for insurance liability specific to, um, uh, to my understanding, to the UK and Ireland. Um, the best, uh, because I know many of our members have looked into it and tried to find... Um, ways to uh, overcome it. The best uh, thing uh, I would tell you is to look uh, either to co contact um, your national member or a local member that's already doing repair cafes and see how they've overcome it because I know this is very specific, very um, places that have um, specific uh, uh, requirements uh, for the type of liability uh, insurance that's, uh, that's required. It's, it's not just uh, you, it's a lot of people that have uh, locally in uh, the UK and Ireland that have faced this, uh, this challenge and hopefully it'll soon be overcome. Thank you. Alejandro, did you have any, any uh, case of, uh, I don't know, insurance issues or you know the fact that repair cafes or that that part of the the, the legal aspect or people yeah yeah because we are public administration we have to be really covered for that uh after uh, 10 years uh we had problems but just two, two three problems with people uh having injured there just and, and just uh, once uh, it will it, it goes uh, through an the, the insurance solution so yeah, we, we covered for the the public administration. Oh, okay. But but, uh, but also also we have we, we make uh, people register and sign a disclaimer too. You know that if if it's we help you if if the if it gets broken or something, it's your responsibility. It's we are not going to buy you new stuff. Okay. Also, several conditions sign always. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, there was a, a chat conversation and, and not all the participants could see it. So I'm, I'm going to, to share it live. So Alexandra from, uh, from Poland was asking to Alejandro um, if the project was started by the community or, or the municipality um, sharing the, the challenge that it, in Poland um, today, the municipality is not ready, and I quote uh, her, is not ready to go beyond recycling responsibilities, even to create the proper culture in that aspect um, is a challenge. And given the example of, of Krakow, um, as we have in our webinars, uh, most of the time a very diverse audience, it would be interesting. So in the case of Barcelona, Alejandro replied that indeed it was by the municipality, but uh, it would be good to hear also what can we do if we're not the local authority, uh, if we're a citizen, if we're a community, what can we do to actually um, engage with our municipality or make this happen? Or what can we make happen if the municipality is not really into this yet? Do you have any examples on projects that were started from the community and could give some hope <laughs> to the participants? I think the municipalities are more open uh, uh, ears, you can say, 
that we think uh, if people complain to the now we are having elections so now maybe they are more open uh, i mean <laughs> if people ask for that i'm sure the some some time that uh, they will get it because they they want to um, to make us happy you know what i mean uh, it's not the word, but I don't know the word in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but coming from a metropolitan area that is very uh, volun voluntary uh, on on this, I think you it's 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 great to see that there are more um, authorities, regional authorities, public authorities that are willing to do that. But as in the example of of um, of Alexandra, when the city is not ready, do you have examples of uh, yes of community based projects that actually went beyond i don't know if from the reuse network i imagine you have a few of them that you could share the, the repair cafes is the the biggest yeah. idea in that case repair cafe or restart project from london and now it's it's spreading away too yeah exactly in any way i think that the um we use operators uh, themselves need to uh to develop uh like to develop themselves first uh, to show that uh, they have a great impact on uh, both the social aspect and the environmental aspect. And I think that's for, uh, for a lot of cities, uh, the fact that what uh, Antigone mentioned, for example, that in Flanders, there is a 12,000 euro uh, net return for the society for each person we integrated um, through uh, the social economy uh, contracts uh, made by the region. Um, it's it's a way to show that it's not only a cost uh, and that um, the society can really benefit like financially uh, of, uh, of this uh, of uh, reuse. I think, uh, I think you shouldn't be, uh, to our friend in, uh, in Krakow, I, I, I think you shouldn't be afraid if the city is, is not there yet. I mean, uh, uh, many are community based and uh, if if there are enough people that want to do it and they're interested in doing it and uh, you know it can range from uh, uh, getting your local communities to um, you know those uh, examples of uh, you know uh, take a book leave a book or uh, you have uh, the repair cafes you have initiatives where you have swap meetings and you know you arrange a day is for an event and people can go and exchange their goods and things like that and um, if there's enough of a demand then you know uh, uh, a reuse shop will, uh, will develop and so forth I mean you don't necessarily need to be completely dependent on the municipality that being said they're very strong added values for the local authority to support these initiatives uh, it's a win-win for them. So uh, I really, uh, maybe like you said, uh, I, you know, they're not there yet. But, uh, you know, uh, if you're ahead of your uh, of uh, of your local authority, then it's it's you know it's part of the work to build up a momentum so that you can convince them as well. I don't think it's an obstacle that can't be overcome. You know. But uh, I think they do one or two, and then they, they become interested if they see this working. Sorry, Matthew. It's not, no, it's just uh, for the specific case of Poland, you can check uh, in the uh, in the documents uh, that I've put at the end of my presentation. Um, there is one um, link towards one of our position papers about uh, the um, the use of social public procurements, and uh, there were two good examples from uh, Poland. So. It's, it's possible maybe to use these good examples to then uh, convince your municipality to uh, to apply uh, policies on reuse. I will I will put uh, directly the, the link towards uh, this uh, this uh, study now in uh, the chat. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks to the three of you. I think that you um, you, you mentioned some ideas, and and the good thing is 
uh, we know it happens and and I think not only the work of the the metropolitan area of Barcelona but also the the massive work that the reuse network does um, I think it's it's very inspiring and I and I believe there are quite a lot of resources on the reuse website as well on all these cases that uh, we will be sharing after this um, this webinar um, among the key ideas that you mentioned I think this rebranding secondhand or reuse was quite uh, was quite important um, and it's probably part of a new culture that we need to to promote and the, of course the the policy framework helps a lot to accelerate things um, and and i think thank you very much to remind that most of this um, initiatives were community-based and and actually started with the support or not of of the authorities and actually showing the potential um, as maybe a final word i would like each of you to say maybe in a few words um yeah the the evolution that you see um because again as i mentioned earlier um, in the zero waste hierarchy today we are still very much focused on the collection aspect while um, we know that refusing and and prevention and reuse is very key um so what is your, your vision for yeah the next five years what what do you expect to see uh, to see happening Mathieu? Yeah. Well, from my side, it will be uh, I, I, hoping for the most ambitious transposition of the Waste Product Directive, um, which uh, some member states already uh, started to, uh, to implement uh, via roadmaps, um, via legislation, so to, to try to apply the best uh, practices in Europe. Thank you. Antigone? Okay, since uh, Mathieu mentioned the uh, policy and uh, the other way and mentioned uh, mind change and working uh, locally uh, to change the, the mind it's, it's cutting a lot, Antigone. I don't know if you can hear Antigone, any of you? Yeah. I think we lost something. Eh? Yes. <laughs> we, uh, let Let's see if she can come back. Um, yes. Uh, maybe Alejandro. By the time Antigone is yeah. back. The oh. Yes, I think. That yeah, her, her connection has, has stopped, yeah. Um, Alejandro, yes, please. The next, the next years, uh, I hope to see more centers, like more locals, more, more workshops, as I show you, managed by municipality, citizens, or be, uh, both of us, between both sides. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see a new laws about eco-design, as uh, Matthew talked about before, about uh, not just uh, how, uh, more uh, repar reparability uh, items usually in, and how to repair. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm not sure Antigone is going to be back. I think her connection was, yeah, um, dying towards the end. Um, yeah, and, and time is up, so we'll wait maybe for a couple of more minutes to see if, if she if she can come back. But um, yeah, thank you very much for, for helping us better understand what it means, um, these reuse strategies at the local level. Um, we received questions towards the end, uh, but I'm, that's, that's part of the reason why we actually push you to ask questions from the beginning, as we really have want to stop an hour and a half after the beginning. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks a lot to... Uh, to the three of you, also to Antigone. Um, for everyone, as uh, um, Anis explained in the chat, we're going to share the, the presentations and also this recording in the next few days. So feel free to check uh, the different materials and the links uh, shared by the, the panelists. Um, I also use this chance to remind you the, the last webinar of uh, the season. And I think, yes, Antigone is back but I'm not sure it's working well. Yes, it's not working better, I think. 
Um, so yeah, just, just let me um, remind you the next uh, webinar, it's going to be the 3rd of June and it's going to be the introduction on deposit return schemes. Um, so it's going to be the last uh, of this season. So please make sure to register as well um, to the city's newsletter. And the link will be in the chat, uh, which will allow you to, uh, to, to be informed of the upcoming events. And talking about events, this week, uh, part of our team is in Slovenia for the, a study tour, and uh, we'll be sharing some uh, information on social media. Uh, before we wrap up, so Antigone is back. I will just, if it works, give you the chance to share your wrap-up words. Yeah. Okay. We, um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. So what I was saying uh, the... No, I'm I'm sorry, Antigone. It's uh can you try without video maybe? It's also on the on the lights. Yeah, on. So no, I I think the connection is dead. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Yes, maybe you can try to write or can you try to say because now the really the connection is really bad. I will. Ah. Uh, I will write it in the post. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay, well, then I'll try quickly. And if not, I'll just write it in the chat and uh, people can have a look at it later. What I was saying is since Mathieu uh, discussed the, um, the, uh, the policies and measures, uh, I would suggest that uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done uh, in changing attitudes, in, uh, in changing, in, uh, in uh, promoting uh, changes in lifestyle and so forth to, uh, uh, to work with uh, local communities and, uh, and the cities and everyone to, uh, to promote reuse and prevention aspects. I think there's still a lot of work uh, and challenges uh, there to be done uh, as well, both from the, uh, you know, from the reuse shops themselves and from uh, local NGOs and uh, zero waste advocates and, and so forth. Thank you very much, Antigone, and, um, and that will be the final word, actually. So thank you again to the three of you, and thanks to the participants. Um, thanks for the, the questions, and uh, we hope to see you at the next webinar, the 3rd of June, as I said, on Introduction to Deposit Return Schemes, and we will follow up with the presentations and, uh, and recording. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice Bye. afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao.